Uh, friends, I'm, I'm all too well aware of the uh, negative stereotype, the way in which people uh, nowadays might think about uh, a caricature of church in the United States, uh, a group of people gathered together, facing inwards, talking to themselves, who exclusionary, will not invite anybody else to the table, uh, whose thoughts and deeds are perhaps largely irrelevant to the needs of greater society. You may be able to add to the list yourself. I know I can. Uh, but we're not here today to uh, necessarily uh, critique, but instead to imagine, and I hope to show you to reimagine. Imagine if we could take this list and turn it inside out. Imagine if we could take this group of people with their inward focus and make them focus out. Imagine if we could have a group of people who were inclusionary, who would invite others to the table. Imagine if we had a group of people who sought to be relevant to the needs of their neighbors. And then I would ask you to imagine that this happen not just once. In my own tradition, I'm a United Methodist. Some of you might know what that means. It doesn't matter if you don't. What it means to me is that in the western half of the state of Ohio, uh, there's 1,100 other United Methodist churches in addition to the one where I serve. In the region just around Toledo, there's 110. That's just for our little group. Imagine if we had all the different groups, and perhaps we could go further and move from churches to temples to synagogues to mosques and think in ways that look out and that include and that are relevant. Uh, our own little story is that as a person who's a United Methodist elder, I get, to, I get to serve wherever my bishop tells me to serve. And on July the 1st, 2006, my bishop told me to uh, go start a new church. I like to say it's not entirely true, but it sounds good, that he said to me, there's no place, there's no people, and there's no money. But I have the greatest confidence in you. So off we, off we went, and I spent a, a year just talking to people. If I bumped into you somewhere in the street, I would have invited you out to lunch or to coffee, and I would have asked you to tell me if you had any interactions ever with the church community. Were they good? Were they bad? Were they indifferent? Did it matter? What could it look like? What would you want it to look like? And I did that with individuals and groups of people over the course of a year. And then we gathered people together. We started to think through what would the core values of a different type of church actually be? What would the vision be? What would the mission be? What could it look like? And then we started to gather as a group. We called ourselves the University Church. We rented a little office space on the edge of the University of Toledo's main campus. And we would gather in one of their auditoriums that we rented off them. And we just kind of camped out and got to know each other. And then we were very fortunate and able to acquire a piece of land with a little building on it. It's on Hill Avenue in Toledo between Richards and Reynolds. And we moved into uh, this little building on this piece of land uh, in 2010. Well, um, what we did as a result of all of these conversations was conclude to ourselves that we wanted to be a group of people who care about the whole person. This is a, a depiction here of um, a, a needs hierarchy after the work of Maslow, Mas Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure you know of this. Uh, many churches focus all of their efforts at the very top of a needs hierarchy. The top parts of a needs hierarchy are to do with self-actualization and transcendence. And so churches often focus their energy there. The very bottom of a needs hierarchy is about biological and physiological needs. You need food. You need water. And you need clean air. Things like that. And then the other levels go somewhere in between. And so we sat down and we looked at all of these levels of this uh, needs hierarchy. And we thought, are there problems here? Is it true in Toledo, does everybody get enough to eat? 
do people get uh, around the world enough clean water to drink? Uh, is the air that you breathe as you drive through regions inhabited by factories, is it clean and good for you? So we asked these questions, and then we tried to say, if this is a problem, what could the solution be? And could we be part of the solution? So we set out uh, to do all of that. Ooh, that's not mine. <laughs> None of that's mine. Help. <laughs> so we moved on. Um, hopefully somebody can look at this and fix it while I just fill in here. What we decided to do was to sit down and focus on some very specific areas, but to do it in this inclusionary way. So we said we have our entire vision and mission. Imagine that as a big circle. And you, perhaps in your organization or group of people, you have a vision and mission, and it's a big circle. And maybe our two circles just overlap a little bit. We can work together there. All of these other things that might be differences that we hold, the places where our circles do not overlap, there we go, the places where our circles do not overlap, we will not bring those to the table. The only thing that will be on the table will be the area where our missions overlap with each other. And we did this in a very intentional way. We thought about the society in which we're embedded in terms of sectors, there's the government sector, the educational sector, the health sector, the nonprofit sector, and so on and so forth. And in each one of those sectors, there are, of course, different levels. Like in the government sector, there's the federal government, the state government, the county, the city. And we set about establishing strategic alliances at every level in every sector. Some of these strategic alliances involve formal contractual arrangements. Some are established through memoranda of understanding. And some are simply that we agree to show up together at the same place at the same time and do the same thing. We manage then to establish interactions at nearly all levels of these different sectors. And then we set about introducing people in different columns at different levels to each other. Uh, that was our, our way of operating, our modus operandi here. In every one of those cases, the only thing that's allowed on the table is where we overlap with each other. We will not let our differences, whatever they might be, be on the table when we hold such conversations. So um, we wound up setting for ourselves four big objectives. There isn't time to talk about all four. I'd just like to briefly mention two. Uh, there will be no hungry people, no people left hungry in our neighborhood. Not one. That's our objective. Uh, the other one is that all children in our neighborhood will be safe, cared for, and valued. So we set off making strategic alliances, everything we could think of to do with food, nutrition, the relationship between nutrition and health. We set about working with uh, our local elementary school, with Toledo Public Schools, with the University of Toledo, with the University of Michigan, and we set up an enormous uh, set of collaborations, calling on people where we had shared mission, shared desires, but where they had expertise that we did not. So as a result of all of that, um, we then said, if we're going to be serious about this, we have to sit down and realign our staffing and our budget and everything else in order to accomplish these goals that we've set for ourselves. Um, I do not know, to be honest, of any other church around here that has a full-time farmer on its staff, but we do because we're on a piece of land that has nine acres of land and we have this vision of church's urban farm where we grow food. We grow a lot of food. We partner with organizations, Sam who introduced me from Food for Thought, for example, and others. Uh, we take food to our local school, we feed in excess of 100 children a day now at our local school. We have a school program director who works for us, we pay for them. They spend almost all day, every day, in our local school. Uh, they work there with programming for children, an after-school program, a preschool program. We brought together people from the health community and the school community, and we're very hopeful that this fall, for the first time, we will have a pediatrician in our local elementary school, working in the school with 
the children. So we realigned our budget and our finances to go along with uh, the vision that we had. So we, we take advantage of our piece of land. That's just a little aerial photograph of it. There are nine acres of land for a big community garden project. It's all about growing food, growing awareness, growing compassion. Uh, last Wednesday, we picked 1,372 pounds of fruits and vegetables in one day, um, which by the next day, we had given away over 1,000 pounds of that food. We have a, a little boy at, uh, in a, who's part of our community who recently came to an event. It was much like this, only it was held in a big church downtown. His mum brought him along just to be supportive because I was speaking. And this little boy, whose name's James, ran into the middle of the room, span around into a circle, and he said to his mother, is this a church? And she said, yes, James, this is a church. And he said, well, if it's a church, where's the chickens? Because we have chickens for eggs and ducks and turkeys and bees for honey. We have uh, hydroponics and aquaponics and all of the other things one would hope to do to be serious about growing food. Then uh, we did it again. Our local elementary school is in the last picture. It's a picture of the front of the elementary school in which we work. Um, we've worked uh, there. We worked for two years in conversation with the teachers, the parents, the staff, the unions, everybody else, two years of conversation to find ways that we could fit in and help in a school in which somewhere around 95% of the children are on free and reduced price lunches. And our community is difficult. And so now we have a fully functioning operation there. My very last slide, which apparently the slideshow is not cooperating with me, it was simply to show you that this is not imagining a church for the first time. This is really, truly reimagining. And it's reimagining because in my tradition as a, as a Methodist, we trace our history back. We have a history and it traces back to a man called John Wesley, who was an Anglican priest. He lived in the 1700s. He was born in 1703 in England. And famously, in one of his sermons, he said, though we may not think alike, may we not love alike. And then he said, assuredly, we can. Thank you.